Morning. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Gosh, sorry. I've had computer issues this week. I can't, if I have Google Chrome open, I can't type in any other window or like access any other window on my computer. So it's, I have to like jump from one thing to another. Um, just give me one second here. I'm also, yeah, hold on. This isn't going to work like it was. Ugh. Apologies. It's just kind of been one of those weeks where I'm behind on everything. Uh, okay, well, we've got some stuff to talk about today. I'm pretty excited about it. I hope you guys are too. Um, I, uh, we have uh, some summer training tips and stuff kind of on the docket for today. Um, yeah, I was just looking at the weather and it's going to apparently rain um, all this weekend here in Colorado. So um, it's, it's just kind of funny that we're talking about heat training and all this stuff and then it's going to freaking rain. Um, but hey, I hope, you know, somebody will find this helpful sometime in the future. Uh, maybe not for this weekend. Cool. Let me Hot see. o'clock somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Somebody right now is heat training. Okay, I gotta see if I can get my notes up here without crashing my computer. There you go. Okay. Actually, Zoe, can I make you the host of this? Because I can't open two windows at once on my computer right now. Thank you. There you go. Perfect. That way. Oh, wow. Okay. So plenty of people are heat training right now. Good to hear. Good to hear. Glad you guys are putting the time in. <laughs> I did my heat training due diligence yesterday. My, my double was in 94 degrees, um, actually. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about this later, but um, Zoe and I have been using the sauna a lot this summer. And I've actually found that it's been really helpful. Um, okay, cool. So, yeah, we've got a lot of notes here. Summer training, expectations around summer training. Um, obviously, the heat component is an important part of this um, because the heat makes everything feel a lot harder. Um, and we've talked a little bit about this in the past, but I think it's always good to readdress these things like every year. Um, I know that in my training logs with athletes lately, and I've, I've heard this from the other coaches too, um, people are kind of just like freaking out about their like runs in the heat. Um, there's no other way to like put it. Um, it's, I think like just part of kind of being a person where you're like, oh, I, I know this is going to be hard. Um, it's going to be in the eighties today or you know, I think where a lot of people feel it is, you know, mid seventies and up um, this time of year, we just, you don't have that like baseline of every run being in the seventies or eighties, you're not acclimated to it. And so that first, those first couple runs just feel awful. And then it's this like perfect avenue for our human brains, for self-judgment, self-criticism, and then to extrapolate all of these things from these tough, hot runs that tell us I'm not a good athlete, I'm not getting better, um, and, and all of the rest of it. You know, I think that this is something that we're seeing a lot and it's something that, yeah, we can all work on. Um, just trying to approach these <laughs> hot, hard runs with a little less self-criticism and self-judgment. Um, so yeah, um, 
Josh, I, I want to maybe ask a coach a question to kind of like maybe get into this a little bit more. Um, yeah, let's go around the horn real quick and see what every coach's approach is um, to long runs, to hot long runs. Um, and I think that there's so many different ways to approach this, but just um, to narrow it in a little bit, like, are we thinking avoid the heat or embrace the heat? Are we thinking spring the heat? Okay. Well, we'll start with Zoe. She's jumping right in. All right, Zoe, what's your, how do you kind of like line up your long runs on days where you know it's going to be hot? Yeah. I mean, well, it's also, you know, caveat with all topics discussed, right? It depends on you, your background, your goals. Um, you know, my athletes who are training in Arkansas, like, do they necessarily need to wait till high noon just to hurt more? No, they definitely do not. Um, but, you know, athletes who are training for races that are going to be hot definitely do need to not make a habit of, you know, like even if you're, you know, you work a job, you need to get out and like do your normal weekday runs at 6 a.m., all that's great. Then those long runs become an even better opportunity to practice, um, you know, to do heat training, basically. So I would say if you have a goal that will involve heat exposure, you need to embrace that and lean into that as much as possible without like obsessing about it. Like even training for Western States, I'm not doing all my runs at the hottest time possible. Cause that'll actually make you slow down. It'll overstress you. That's not necessarily the best way to train for a race. Like particularly, um, you know, I've done some key long runs and workouts in the heat, but I haven't tried to make all of them like as slow and painful as possible. Um, even though I'm training for a historically hot race. So I would say don't avoid the heat um, unless like, I mean, honestly, if you don't have, if you really, well, if, if it's gonna be something you can avoid forever, then that's fine. The problem becomes if you always avoid it and then at a certain point it becomes unavoidable and then you're not adapted, that's where the problem is. So I would think about- Yeah, let me jump in. Exposing yourself. Let me jump in, Zoe, because I think when you, you know, you first started talking about this, you said, you know, this is very individual. What are your goals? Um, and when we're talking like summer, most everybody is racing. Um, a lot of our athletes are running ultras and those races are many hours long. Um, and so something that I, you know, try to prompt athletes with and tell them about is like, in a long race, no matter what time you start, it's summer, sorry, it's summer, and there's gonna be a moment in that race when it's hot. Um, if you're running an ultra, you're almost not gonna be able to avoid the heat. Whether you're up high and you're above 10,000 feet, it's 65, 70 degrees, but full sun exposure, that's still gonna feel really hot. Or whether you're you know, down in the canyons at Western States, and it's hundred degrees radiating, you know, off all the different walls and it's hot, it's still going to be hot. Um, and so when you're running these long races, there's almost no avoiding moments where it feels hot. Um, so just to go back to Zoe's point, you know, what kind of race are you running? What are you planning for? How long is it going to be? Okay. I'm going to use these things to influence and inform my training. Yeah, uh, let's let's keep going around because um, I know everybody's kind of got a different approach to this. It kind of sounds like Zoe's approach was, you know, recognizing the need to run in the heat, um, but maybe not like, I don't know, going overboard with how to prioritize that, um, trying to find a balance. Um, you know, I think just like having observed some of her training you know, going out, knowing that she'd be, you know, a little bit later, knowing that she'd be running, you know, maybe the second half of that long run in pretty warm conditions. Um, that's kind of what I've been observing in Zoe's training lately. Sarah, what's, what's your approach on that long run day to, to dealing with, you know, the heat timing wise and lining it all up? Yeah. So I tend to start early in the morning. I like to start early in the morning, sort of regardless. Um, that's like my time of day, but, you know, I think because the long, by the end of the run, if it's a long run, I will, it'll be hot enough that I'm getting, 
the exposure, I'm getting, you know, a little bit of that training, but still not adding unnecessary stress on the day. Um, so I try if I can to not run in the middle of the day for my long runs, I might do that more like in the middle of the week and try to like add that little stressor on a day where there's maybe like less other stress. Um, and I really like prioritize hydration and like I make popsicles and I have things in my car waiting for me that are really cold that I like think about and look forward to. Um, and yeah, but I definitely, I'm not one who likes to run in the middle of the day, especially in my long runs, if I can help it. I feel like yeah. road runners and trail runners are just so different. Like trail runners generally are like, it doesn't matter what the conditions are. It can be a hundred degrees, like F it, I'm going in where well, you see a lot of road runners with their marathons, whether it's Boston or New York or Chicago or whatever, even half or full marathon, they usually kind of bookend the year. So a lot of in like spring, winter, uh, fall, not a whole lot of long races in the summer. And so when you're approaching summer training for maybe some of these fall events, um, it's not as necessary, in my opinion, to get some of these, you know, uh, purposeful, like, hot day running or long run um, type deals in. Obviously it's hot no matter what, like here where I'm at in Arkansas, I'll wake up in the morning and as soon as the sun comes up, it's already 85 degrees and it's only getting warmer throughout the day. And it's like 80% humidity on top of that. So it's not easy, um, but, but waiting until it's later in the day, waiting until it's 90 degrees just doesn't suit me for maybe some of the races kind of going back to what Zoe said, it depends on you and your goals. Um, but, but heat training, um, as it pertains to the long run, uh, I don't want everyone to think that it's absolutely necessary for everyone. Uh, oftentimes, um, it can inhibit training. It can really, I mean, obviously we'll go through all the list of like, reducing your pace and all that kind of stuff, but sometimes it's just not necessary. And sometimes the, the risk outweighs the reward uh, when you're just not needing to experience it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Nice primer for the rest of this conversation, Drew. Um, before we jump into that, I do want to hear from Kylie. Um, you know, I see her out there. We're kind of like on the same morning running routine often. Um, and so I'm just curious what Kylie, what's your, what's your approach? Yeah, it's interesting. Cause I, I grew up in a road running background, like Drew was saying, and we would always, um, we would always do our long runs like super early in the morning to try and honestly, to try and beat, beat the heat. But then, um, trail running wise, I, I feel like I haven't thought about that as much. And I actually, um, will go out like later in the day on purpose. Cause I feel like it, uh, it helps me adapt to the heat more. Um, but I think to Sarah's point, like kind of strategically looking at your lifestyle and, um, you know, what do you have going on that day, et cetera, because heat training, like in a long run, it can kind of wipe you out the rest of the day as well. Um, so looking at that and then I think strategically including, some um, heat training, maybe not every long run, et cetera, would be my approach. Yeah, awesome. Um, it's just so great to hear from everybody because again, you know, like Zoe kind of kicked this off saying, it's really individual, depends on your needs, your goals, depends on, you know, some people tend to like handle the heat a bit better. Maybe they're from, they grew up in warmer climates, more humid climates. Um, you know, personally, like I've always been someone who doesn't necessarily do that well in the heat or feels like I, I played college tennis. Um, and when we would train in Florida in, in spring, I would like really struggle in the heat, um, coming from upstate New York, very cold all the way down to Florida without any time to like acclimate. Um, I would always like really struggle. Um, and so that's actually something that personally, like I have been focusing on a lot in the last few seasons, because I, like I mentioned before, in a long ultra few, you know, six hours, five hours, eight hours, whatever, you know, or more, and you're, there's just no way you're going to avoid the heat. 
Um, it doesn't matter if you start at 5 a.m. You're not going to avoid the heat. And so something for me, I think that makes this difficult is the, um, is the contrast between the morning temps starting off quite cool. Um, and then that like around 11 o'clock and then onwards in the day when it's really starting to get warm, um, that kind of like variation in temperature really affects me, my sweat rate, um, my like sodium like concentration. I think it changes when it's cool and when it's really warm. Um, so, you know, that's something that I actually try to mimic in my own training. Um, that way I can prepare, I can listen to my body and I can change in, a, in the moment to what I'm feeling out there. So that's kind of always been my approach. Like don't start too early, but start early enough that it feels cool. And you're going to notice the difference in the temperature later on, um, and then be able to practice responding to that. Um, I think, you know, just kind of like, yeah, moving the conversation forward, Drew had mentioned, you know, some of the like physiological benefits to running in the heat versus and acclimating to it versus kind of some of the, maybe the downsides. Um, yeah, Drew, I, I'd like to just kick it back to you. Um, maybe just fill us in on some of the, yeah, the things that you think like an athlete might lose out on if they're doing all of their long runs or maybe even a lot of their weekday easy runs in, in like the really hot temperatures in order to try to adapt. Yeah. So really for me, it's important to understand what is hot. I mean, obviously it's relative as everyone's body um, kind of uh, functions differently and, and experiences heat differently. Um, doing some reading leading up to this call um, on trail runner magazine, I read that um, for every, it's like 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit over 59 degrees, you end up, and this is an average, obviously, a runner slows down between one and four seconds per mile. Um, and so kind of understanding that, that you're slowing down, the hotter it is, like it's outside of your control, they're, they're physiological impacts to your body. Um, and, and so knowing that when it comes to like, we, I know we keep talking about the long run, it's only because the long run is to me, the most important run of the week really. Um, but how, uh, sometimes as it gets hotter, you get slower, like your body, uh, like the dehydration factor, um, the, the increase or risk for injury, um, kind of creeps up a little bit. Um, to me, oftentimes that's just not worth it. Um, as a coach, I feel like one of my primary functions is to help runners mitigate injury. And so I understand that it's important to kind of maybe slowly introduce some of those, uh, maybe shorter runs may not start with your long run in the middle of the day, but shorter runs, um, getting more acclimated that way, but trying to reduce that injury, um, rate, uh, as you're, as you're, you know, experiencing those hotter temperatures. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of physiological factors. I took a ton of notes, but I don't want to like hog the the time or whatever but um i'd, I'd yeah. be curious to see what zoe is experiencing on a physiological level with her heat training that she's been doing getting ready for western states next week yeah i i before i just i think it's not necessarily relevant to mention zoe because i just based on what you're saying drew what what i'm hearing is like as coaches we are all working on really helping our athletes get better at running, right? And so like this involves efficiency, economy of motion, um, and that when it's hot, we slow down. Um, and you mentioned like a pretty significant slowdown, just like when it's 60 degrees, you know, when it starts at 60 degrees and then the hotter it gets, we slow down. Um, when we slow down for an athlete who's already running, I don't know, 11 minute miles or slower, um, that slowdown is really, really significant. Um, it's a lot less significant for an athlete like Zoe, who's, you know, running 750 minute pace, you know, easy around town, you know, on her easy days or whatever that like slowdown, she's still going to be economical at, you know, when it's a hundred degrees, she's still going to have light, quick strides, feet landing underneath her, running with good form, but for another athlete, maybe a mid packer, um, or an athlete who's like 
really trying to level up in their training, do a longer race. They're not quite as, you know, far along in the process as Zoe that they might have to walk. And so that is a significant difference. And the slower we go, usually for newer athletes, the, the worse our efficiency is, the less um, likely we are to use light, quick strides. We start plotting, we start having more ground contact time, which ups the rate for injury, like you mentioned, Drew. Um, so, you know, to me, those are some like of the immediate like downsides of running when it's too hot. You're putting an athlete who's already pushing themselves a lot in a really stressful situation. They're forced to slow down. That doesn't bring out their, their best self and it reinforces bad habits over the long term. Um, especially when these runs are like many hours long. Think about, you know, when I first started running ultras and getting into training and doing long runs in the mountains and I wasn't very fast, you know, 20 miles might have taken me six, seven hours. Um, that's a long time to be out there plodding around. Um, and then you're really sore the next day and it's hard to bounce back and not to mention some of the nutritional things when you're out there for that long too. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to recognize that. And I think for a lot of athletes, um, especially newer athletes training in the heat, it's probably beneficial to just go out when it's really, really cool in the morning the, the, you know, the end of your run is going to be in hotter temps. Um, and that's great. We're already probably slowing down a little bit at that part of the long run anyways, but trying to get out there and not put too much stress on the system, utilize the cool temps to, you know, be able to move a bit quicker, have your best form, your best biomechanics. I, mean, um, I don't know if that down, brought anything else to mind for the other coaches. They wanted to kind of jump in on that. I mean, that works just, if you can choose when you run. Yeah. But I have right. a lot of athletes that run after work. Um, and that's like, it's fine. I would say it's fine to slow down. Don't like, again, like if you can optimize these things, that's great. But if you can't, then I think the focus becomes, you know, really trying to manage what you can and still try to focus on having light, quick strides, not overstriding, not slouching, not having lazy form and heavy feet. Um, and really try to, you know, maintain that, that, that good posture, that high cadence, even when you are running easier. Yeah. Sarah. Yeah. I mean, I'm curious. Um, so keeping in mind what you're saying about, right. So if somebody is really slowing down and now they're walking and their workouts being really impacted and they're supposed to be there, uh, have 20 miles on the schedule, but at mile 15, 16, like they're running, walking, you know, is that a day where we're saying, Hey, you're not getting any as much out of those last few miles. Maybe we're going to cut this run short because the heat is really impacting you. Or would you want the athlete to consider or to continue pushing through and then hiking or walking those final five, six miles? Yeah. You know, I think again, it goes back to our conversation a few months ago with regard to like long run variations. Um, you know, we don't do a lot of like super, super long runs, especially for newer athletes, um, because the, the benefit isn't there because of the loss of, um, of running economy and like kind of the breakdown of the biomechanics out there. So I would say putting a cap on those runs at maybe four hours or five hours, um, and that's even a really long run to be, to be very transparent, um, is probably a good idea. And to not worry so much about the mileage because the body doesn't really know what a mile is. The body only knows how much stress you're putting on it. Um, and so that's even something that I'll do. You know, if I'm having an unproductive day, a long run, um, and I've been out, it's like five, six hours in the San Juans, you know, I'm not quite to 20 miles yet, you know, whatever, you know, like I'm calling it at 18 miles, 17 miles, um, because, you know, I want to not compromise fully the next day's training and make sure that I can recover. And we're talking about being out in the heat for that long. Um, it's really important, the nutritional and hydration side of this as well. So if you're, if you're really dialed in on those things, you know, maybe you're going to respond 
and you're going to be able to recover the next day. But for a lot of people, I think, um, who are, you know, out there for that long, we're still working through the nutritional piece. We're still trying to dial all of these different things in. Um, and so maybe mitigating some of that risk, lowering the stress by putting a time cap on it could be, could be really effective. And then to Zoe's point about like, you know, running early only makes sense. Like if you can run early, well, yeah, obviously. Um, but at the same time, if you're an athlete who like has to do their long run in the heat, maybe that time cap is important. Um, but again, like if you're, you know, an athlete who is maybe mid pack or you're a little bit newer to the sport and you need to get out early on your long run to make it as quality as possible, you know, you can go out in the afternoons on your easy runs and run your 30, 40 minute easy run when it's warmer out. That's a much shorter run. It takes a little time for the heat to take like a toll. You're not going to be feeling it like generally like off the first like couple strides. Um, and so use that as an opportunity to run and acclimate a little bit more in the heat and mix that up. Um, you know, for me, like if I do a hot run one day, I probably will want to do a cooler run the next day just to like try to lower um, that stress a little bit and make things feel a little bit easier. Because again, like we talked about in the beginning of this call, it's very easy to get in our own heads about how we're doing, what our performance is like when we're running in the heat, right? Because it slows us all down at every level. Um, and so what we feel and our perception of our reality is in those moments is, I'm not doing that great. This hill really feels hard in the heat. My God, like, am I even moving? And it's just like this opportunity for self-judgment. And if we put ourselves in that position day in and day out, um, you know, even the most mentally tough are probably going to start to develop some like negative associations with the training. And it's going to get harder to go out there and perpetuate the process and to continue, therefore, and to continue to grow. So my advice would be to like stagger these things, um, you know, do your best with, re with like regard to what your schedule is. Um, if you have to run in the heat, put a time cap on it. If you feel like you're going to be out there for forever, um, don't grind it out. If it's like you're feeling dehydrated, you're not like fueling that well, um, or your stomach started to bother you, whatever it is, you don't have to like grind it out to the point of no return. Um, you know, use it as an opportunity to develop awareness and then to be able to say, you know what, like I've done my best today, hard stop. We're going to reset and go again tomorrow. Um, some of the benefits, gosh, I feel like we talked about how challenging, um, all of this is. Um, I was wondering, yeah, if one of the coaches wanted to just mention a couple of the like physiological, biological benefits to running in the heat. Zoe? Uh, heat is poor man's altitude. If you are living somewhere like Arkansas, but want to race somewhere like Silverton, heat can help um, raise your blood volume and can give you some slight adaptations when you go to altitude. Um, so can sauna protocols, just running in the heat, things like that can be really beneficial for it. It also just make, um, I mean, specifically doing heat protocols, like a sauna protocol or hot bath protocol, or doing some intentional runs in the heat can help your body become more efficient at sweating, at hydrating, um, at basically, because you're forcing it to adopt cooling systems, it makes it more efficient at those things. So again, like that would be my appeal for, again, it's so dependent on who you are, where you wanna go, where you're at. Um, but if you never force your body to practice those things, it's not going to be very good at them, but there are physiological benefits to it. Yeah. Namely blood volume and getting better at cooling, more efficient cooling. Yeah. I mean, you're, you get better at dilating and then sweating really quickly and a lot <laughs> for me, uh, a surprising amount. So, um, but that being said, I was actually, uh, I was reading, was I'm traveling by myself this week and was reading some fun studies on sauna protocols last night. And there's some interesting like differences when you look at how sauna exposure breaks down in like 
highly trained athletes versus untrained athletes. Like it can have some really interesting, like in more highly trained athletes, it causes you to produce more cortisol, but it can also potentially have more, um, like immune boosting white blood cell production benefits. So it really kind of depends on your level of fitness, how you respond to intentional heat exposure. That's very interesting. Yeah, I hadn't. Wow, that's cool. Please uh, link us to that article so we can all check it out um, afterwards. Yeah, great. Um, so more summer running stuff. Let's, let's go on to talking a little bit Oh, actually one thing we, before we roll out and talk about the nutrition stuff, workouts, what it's hot. Um, my 10 cents on doing your intervals and your workouts when it's hot is your interval day, your workout day, Wednesdays for most people, it's already stressful enough. Do that run in the coolest temperatures that you possibly can, um, given your life, your schedule, what you have going on. Um, we want those sessions to be as productive as we can. And it really helps if you do those in cooler temps. You're also just going to feel better. Um, again, when it's hot, everything is slower. It feels hotter. When we're doing intervals, those are already really hard. Um, let's try to like compartmentalize. Hard days hard. You don't have to make it any harder on yourself by doing it when it's 100 degrees out for the sake of adaptation um, to the heat. Any other coaches want to chime in on that before we move on to the nutrition stuff? No, 100% agree. Uh, hard workouts are already hard. Uh, that includes long run. Not going to beat a dead horse here, but if you want to start uh, experimenting with that hot stuff, easy runs, run in the heat conditions is a great place to start. So it's kind of like hard days running cool temperatures, easy days, maybe start to play around with some of those higher temperatures so that you can start to develop some of those beneficial physiological adaptations. Totally, totally. And just to remember guys, like it's normal to slow down out there. You start when it's cool and it gets hot throughout the run. That slowdown is kind of part of the process. Don't use that as an opportunity for self-judgment really try to activate your inner coach, use some positive affirmations, reframe, think about the kind of like blood volume adaptation that you're getting, how much better you're going to feel later on in the summer when you do acclimate to the work. I like to tell athletes this time of year to like try to lean into those warmer moments. Um, that investment that you put into it now is really going to help you out at your race. It's really going to help you out in future long runs. Like it's June 17th. It's not getting any cooler, not for the next couple of months. Um, and so if we can put a little bit of time into this now, it's going to really benefit us all later. So Kylie, I'm going to jump to you because you're the fueling expert. Um, let's, I want to start this off by talking about how the heat affects appetite. Um, this is something that like I've noticed in myself, I've noticed in runners that I coach is that when it's hot, um, it becomes, it acts like an appetite, like suppressor. And it sometimes even becomes more difficult to get in the same amount of calories that you could when it's cooler. Can you kind of fill us in on why that is and what athletes can kind of do to help like, I don't know, work with that rather than um, against it? Um, yeah, so when you're training in the heat, uh, there's a couple of factors at play because the um, dehydration is also gonna affect um, hunger and fullness levels. And then your leptin and ghrelin hormones, with their, which are your hunger and fullness hormones get altered. Um, so thinking about that and knowing kind of how it typically affects you, um, is important. I would say, uh, afterwards having a plan, we've talked about this on other calls. Like, I think one of the biggest things that I see that athletes forget about is immediately trying to, you want to go for the hydration and the electrolytes in addition to your protein and carbohydrates. Um, I see a lot of athletes just go for like a protein shake or 
you know, maybe a little like protein carb snack, um, but they totally forget about that fluid and electrolyte replenishment piece. And it can, um, that can really impact then the rest of the day if you're not replacing that fluid and electrolyte piece as well. So making sure that you interpret or interpret, uh, kind of plan ahead for, um, for rehydration, replenishment of losses. And then um, if you know you're not someone that doesn't have an appetite, thinking about liquid uh, smoothie type options um, to be able to get down some calories as well. Um, I'll even have athletes like uh, make a smoothie in the morning if they're going to like a trailhead and they'll put it in a cooler and then when they're done it's like ready for them I mean that's extreme prep there but uh but I mean it, it works great because then they're able to get something in whereas you know others might bring more solid food and they're like I'm not eat, I don't do not want to eat this I'm trying to like choke it down um so so thinking about like how you are in that situation um I don't know if you wanted me to touch on during as well or okay. Yeah, uh, if, you, if you could. Yeah. So during um what I often see in the heat is uh people getting more sweet fatigue, meaning they get sick of sweet items. Um, and the body just kind of says, I am not, I'm not gonna take this down. Um, and so the gels and the chews and maybe the hydration mix that had worked for a while might not be appealing after a couple of hours. Um, so I always have people think about, um, think about bringing a savory option with them, especially if they're training for a longer ultra event, um, thinking about like what could work for me and testing that, testing something like that out, like mini potatoes with salt or like nut a little maybe little nut butter honey nut butter packets or something um so just having that option and then I oftentimes get uh I get a lot of athletes that come to me that are struggling with like nausea or trying to troubleshoot their fueling plan um sorry the dogs are <laughs> being a little crazy um troubleshoot their fueling plan and then they'll get nauseous in the heat um, and, uh, a lot of people think that that, uh, is due to maybe the sweet items that they're using. Unfortunately, it can be a complex, um, situation where it could actually be related to the fluid and electrolyte piece, which is kind of a nice, um, maybe transition into like fluid loss rate and sodium sweat loss. Um, but I don't know if you want to bring in any other coaches and like maybe their favorite things to to use in the, in the heat or products to use or something like how, if anyone's used savory products and their experience, um, before you go into fluid losses and sodium sweat concentration. Yeah. You know, I feel like we've already really like gone into great detail on, on this fluid loss testing and, and the sodium sweat concentration testing like two calls ago. So maybe we'll gloss over that for today and, and talk more about, you know, like what we can do practically on, on these long runs in the heat and during our races, um, assuming that we have this information about ourselves. Um, and I'll link in the, uh, in the notes of this, uh, where you guys can go back and listen to Kylie give a very um, in-depth description on the importance of those tests. Uh, but essentially, Kylie, you know, something that I know that I notice and other athletes notice is that when it's hot, that, that balance of sodium, that balance of, of fluid and making sure you're getting in 75% of sodium loss and 75% of fluid loss, you're replenishing. Um, it can be, yeah, like more difficult when it's hot to assimilate those things um, into the GI system. And sometimes you know, I, I hear from athletes, oh, my stomach was sloshy. Oh, um, I was running the downhills and I could feel like the fluid in my stomach. Um, and my understanding of this is because when it is very hot, the blood that was in your GI system that's helping you to digest diverts towards the skin in order to help 
cool your system to help create dilation. Um, and so you cool. And so that when things move away from the GI area, it becomes more difficult to digest. And this is why athletes have trouble um, getting in the same amount of calories that they would normally when it's cool out, they're struggling to make like 300 calories an hour when it's hot. Um, are there ways that we can, what would you recommend Kylie in situations like that for an athlete who's having trouble? I don't know, just digesting the food that they're eating. Maybe they're experiencing some GI distress, assuming that they're, you know, getting in the, the proper amount of fluids and the proper amount of sodium for them. So training in the heat again is actually going to help with that, with that piece. Um, but you know, if you're at that point, unfortunately, like there isn't a lot that you can do unless you slow down your pace and you might have to like walk a bit. If you're really at that point of like sloshy stomach, et cetera. Um, I would say like also, unfortunately, um, if you're not getting in enough, that can actually cause the problem to be worse. Um, so, um, you know, I'm not so sure, like, yes, digestion can slow slightly, but I'm not so sure I would say like eat less because it's hot out. Um, because you think that's causing your sloshy stomach. Cause I actually think it could be the opposite. <laughs> um, so like if you're eating less, because you think you're going to get the sloshy stomach, it actually might be causing the sloshy stomach. Um, and I would be suspicious if the person is continuing to get this, if the fluid and electrolyte piece is properly dialed. And if it, um, you can experiment with like intake patterns as well. Um, because like, if you're trying to take in too much, like at one time, that could be an issue, even fluid wise, electrolyte wise. Um, I see a lot of people using, uh, electrolyte capsules, which can cause like a huge amount of electrolyte to go in at one time, um, which can sometimes make a problem worse. Um, so I actually really like the base performance salts that are like a kind of a blend of salt that you can, it has different electrolytes in it and you carry it with you. And then you can kind of microdose your electrolytes. You you lick your thumb and then you put it over I, the cap and then so you lick I've your been, thumb again. I've been practicing with you because I was really hopeful to use them for Western states. And I think, again, things vary, but I've actually had trouble, like particularly in races where you're running the whole time or really trying to run. Um, it's kind of like, so it like comes in a little tube and you flip the cap up and you like put your thumb on it and lick your thumb. Like, I, I think I've, I don't know. And maybe people would have advice. Like this is me asking for advice. I've really struggled to use that because the recommended dosage is doing that like every 20 minutes. And that's kind of a lot to manage when I'm already eating every 15 to 20 minutes to also add on top of that licking electrolytes. And I've also like straight up dropped the tube and like salt spills out of it. I don't, I've just struggled with like the practicality of this product yeah, so I super like maybe it's just I'm a klutz and maybe it's not a good option for me, but I've, I've, I've had a well, hard time. It shouldn't time be with every 20 minutes. I mean, so it shouldn't technically, you shouldn't be taking in maybe a full serving every 20 minutes. That's kind of a lot. Um, what I've determined is about five licks of base salt is one serving and that's 290 milligrams of sodium. So you really need to figure like, what else am I taking in too? Do I need 200? Like you don't want, I mean, I would assume you might not want 900 milligrams of sodium an hour if you're doing every 20 minutes. Um, so potentially the uh, directions on the package aren't what I would recommend. Yeah, because <laughs> um, I, I think it says on the package, like take every one to two miles. And I'm like, okay, so maybe I'm doing this 100 times at Western States. Like that's- No, no. Yeah, you definitely don't want to take it that often. And you know, for a lot of my athletes, it's only like a lick or two per hour, uh, because they're supplementing other things that they're using. Mm -hmm. So if you're using like scratch labs or something, like you're going like, to get like 300 something from that. And then some of your gels will have some sodium in it. So you really don't, you might not need a lot extra, but you want a little boost, which is why I actually like them because with the salt tabs, then you're 
that's a set amount that you're getting. And it might be like 200, 300 milligrams at one time, which for some people is fine. Like you have a good stomach, but um, for others, like that can be a lot at one time and it can actually potentially cause more GI distress. So like with the base performance salts, um, I usually, I forget what it is, like 60 milligrams per lick or something is what um, I usually just kind of estimate. Um, and then you can kind of figure out like, do I even, do I need more? Do I not? And it can be a nice way to just micro dose it. Um, but it's not something that I guess I would use every 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> um, and that's kind of what I did at my 50 K was just like, it's an additional, like little supplemental thing occasionally, um, that, um, I would think about like if I was an athlete doing a, an ultra event or something, or even not an ultra, just thinking about how that those amounts and then how often would you need to take a lick or two, or, you know, depending on like what you're doing. Um, cause some of, some of my athletes aren't using hydration mix with calories either, because they just can't handle the, the sugar types in the mixes. So they will use something like base performance salts. You can, you can actually put it directly in the water um, and get that blend from your water or they'll just use water and then they will do like five licks an hour or something. In that case, then yeah, it would, you'd have to get a little bit better at, uh, at like opening the tube and like taking the licks. But still, it, I doubt that it would be like 15 licks an hour, you know, like the tube yeah. size or something, you know, that's a lot. So yeah. Yeah. No, I was a lot struggling of sodium. with like how to use it. Pra like it would be something that I would be psyched to use at aid stations, but I was again, like was struggling to use yeah. it as direct. Well, you're probably trying to use it. Uh, you're probably trying to use it, uh, to maybe too much, unfortunately. Well, I got well, like, so let me, uh, let me jump in guys. I, I feel like we're getting into the weeds here on this one product and although it's actually a good topic though, I, I find that it's something yeah, that I mean, don't that's know like, about, you know, but I think it is worth discussing. Like if you can't, if you like, if I'm struggling to use a product that seems to indicate that maybe other humans might as well. And I mean, yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to be, you know, again, like if we're going to recommend something I want to be, and I've used it and struggled with it. That seems like pertinent information. Well, I think we covered that and it came across really well. Um, you know, something that I'm, I'm really taking from this though, is that like none of this stuff is helpful for anybody. If you don't know your fluid loss and you don't know your sweat concentration, we're just guessing. Um, and so how many licks, well, how many do you need? Um, and I know this based on, you know, whether what's worked in past long runs. And if I've recorded that and I know how much sodium I'm taking in per hour and how I feel when I take that sodium in per hour, or I have a sodium sweat concentration test to go off of. Um, and something that I did a test and I found that it was very different from the Gatorade test I did. Um, and so there's a lot of tests out there. Make sure you do a good test. Um, the level and test that Kylie recommends, I found that to be really helpful. Um, that helps to inform my decisions when I'm on my races and in my long runs. Um, uh, and I think I think the point too is that you uh, personalizing it for yourself is really important. So like understanding like that these products work for me, these don't work for me. Like some people can't they really can't handle hydration mix um you know as much as somebody might say like oh that's not true like you can take hydration mix there are people that cannot handle hydration mix so like there needs to be an alternative for them or um you know some people really can't the gels like do not sit with them well so they need to use whole food options and so figuring out like what is going to work for you is super important and that's kind of the point i think like it, Zoe makes a good point in the sense that like the base salts, like not a good choice for her maybe. So, um, you know, just thinking about, okay, this is what I want to try. And then that's also a good point. Like you need to try it ahead of time and you need to try it in conditions that maybe the race is going to be in. So like the heat training, going back to the whole conversation of this, um, zoom, 
like the heat training and training with the nutrition that you want to trial and the heat is really important as well, because what might work in the winter might not really feel as great in the summer. Kylie, very directly, how many long runs do you think an athlete needs to practice their fueling on to be ready for their race? So that, that's a loaded question. There's no average um, because it, it really depends. Like it should be changing every, in my opinion, it should change based on your target race. So like you should have a base fueling plan for yourself that tends to work, but depending on like what the race conditions are going to be, what the train looks like, distance, all of that things could change or should change um, depending on that. So practicing with maybe a little bit increased fluid, if it's going to be hotter and you know that you sweat more than, um, or, um, knowing that you might need to have a savory option. Whereas in your 50 K you didn't have a savory option because it wasn't necessary, you know? So those sorts of things, um, I would say that's why I usually recommend if you don't have any fueling plan dialed at least, three months out starting on that process because it takes a while to practice everything. But if you do have something like that you feel like works pretty well, but you wanna maybe tweak it a little bit, I would say at least be um, tweaking it and trialing it within the two months beforehand because you gotta think the week before, a week or two before your event, you're probably not gonna be doing super long run. And so you need to make sure that, uh, that you've got enough that you can kind of just dial in those tweaks. Yeah. I mean, my, if I had to put a number on it, I would say six to eight long runs, um, or roughly two months plus a taper, uh, would be an ideal period to start working on your very specific, um, strategies for like the, how individual that race is, for example, if you're running a race at altitude, you're going to need a little bit more sodium. You might need a little bit more fluid too. And to practice that and to do your training runs whenever you can in similar conditions. So you can get a feel for what it's going to be like. Um, you know, that's not always possible, really difficult case in point, you know, we're in Colorado. Zoe's training for a hot race in California. You know, you can only mimic the conditions like as best that you can to give yourself that chance. But like we've highlighted here, the fueling is very individual. It's very nuanced. It has a lot to do with your race. It has a lot to do with the conditions that you have on hand. Um, just kind of talking a little bit more about like summer training in the last, uh, you know, maybe seven, eight minutes that we've got. Um, what do you guys recommend as coaches for balancing? It's summer. Usually that involves running on trails for most people. Um, trails mean more climbing. What do you guys recommend, um, for athletes and how to like balance steeper runs versus like flatter, easier trail runs? Um, would love to hear from, I don't know, Zoe or, or Drew or you, Kylie, but I know you just talked a lot. I'd say, again, it depends on your goals. Um, it's like fully dependent on your goals and what's available. And also what's fun. Like, I think it is like a really important balance. I know something TJ and I talk about a good bit is like, okay, even if you have like a flatter race or a steep race, make sure you still save some space for runs that are just fun. Like fun runs are good training. Not every run has to be the most perfect, most analog training ever. Um, it doesn't have, you don't want to like sacrifice everything on the altar of specificity. It is totally cool and normal and okay to chase what just like feels good and fun. Um, that being said for long runs, I would try to be specific as much as, as is possible and feels good. If you're able to do long runs, like, again, I'm thinking most of this through a trail perspective. Like if you're training for the Chicago marathon, you don't need to fly to Chicago to do your long runs on the Chicago course. But like, if you're training for a race and you have the ability to go run the course to do a preview, that's great. Do sections of it. Um, you know, I had an athlete ask, she's doing like two races and she wanted to like do 
like 20 mile, like do 18 miles of it for the long run and then drive and finish your long run on a different course. Don't do that. That's too specific. You're actually losing valuable adaptations just by like driving around. Um, try to get on terrain that is analog to your race. So like similar technicality, similar vert per mile. If that's not an option, don't stress, don't beat yourself up, do what you can, but remember to have fun because not only is fun just like a good important part of being a person, it prevents burnout and is good training in that aspect. Yeah, totally. And I think that's super important. You know, if you're running like a, a mountain race and your Saturday long run is like your mountain race and it's, it's a long, it's a long day. It's a lot of climbing. Um, you know, I think it can be beneficial the next day to do something on faster trails. That's a little bit easier on your system that allows you to work more on your turnover and kind of balances those stresses. Um, that's something that I like in my own training. Um, if I do every run steep with a lot of power hiking, um, yeah, I tend to lose some efficiency on the flats and, um, yeah, I mean, that's science tells us that that happens. So, um, I would recommend trying to find that balance again, revert back to what's fun. Um, that should always be, you know, a guide for everybody, a guidepost. Oh, do I enjoy hiking up Aspen mountain 3000 feet straight up? Yeah, I enjoy that. Oh, that's my version of fun. Great. Okay. So I'm going to go do that on a Saturday. Um, but if that's not your version of fun and your fun is like running this hot run around Fruta, Colorado, where it's like a desert, um, you should do that. And then your race should be like that too. Um, in my opinion, what do you guys think on gear? Um, more clothes, less clothes, uh, you know, like, are we wearing long shirts to protect ourselves from the sun? Or are we just like lathering on the sunscreen and you know, embracing what, what, what's your choice? Zoe, I think you're a less clothes person. Less clothes, more lube is my <laughs> strategy always. Um, but some things, you know, again, that I've been trialing for Western states, ice bandanas are so baller. Um, even if you don't have ice to put in it, stopping at creeks, wetting it, twirling it around, putting it around your neck. So awesome. Dunking water on yourself. Love it. Getting arm sleeves that you can keep wet and put ice in. Love it. Put ice in the sports bra, get an ice hat. Um, I have an ice vest to wear at aid stations for Western states. Use use cooling methods to make these runs like more fun and awesome. And like, for me, I've used dunking water on myself as like a fun motivational cue, like picturing myself at Western States, feeling hot, managing it like a boss. Um, yeah. Practice all that on your, on your long runs. Kylie, less clothes or more clothes? I do the less clothes as well. I mean, I'm the person I'm with Zoe, like wearing freaking sports bra in like 40 degrees weather. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, but actually I would say like those with, you know, make sure you wear your skin protection, um, and protect yourself, uh, in that sense, because I do know some athletes and including my dad is a big runner and he ended up with like some skin cancer. Um, and really now he has to wear like covering when he runs in the summer, um, so just being aware of like skin implications as well, being responsible there. Drew, more clothes or less clothes? Well, y'all know I'd run naked if I could, but it's against the law. But <laughs> when it comes to uh, uh, running at elevation, I know that sometimes the sun exposure can be a little bit more drastic, even though it may not feel like it, it is. And so trying to wear something that covers your skin, maybe a hat or something that covers your neck, um, just trying to make sure that the sun doesn't cook you is important. Um, I do know that sometimes if you are going to wear something that covers your skin, like go for it, but make sure that you're wearing something that's actively like wicking moisture off your skin to accelerate the cooling process. Um, don't just wear some cheap piece of shit Walmart long sleeve thing um, that you got for five bucks and expect it to work because not all technical material is made the same. <laughs> Uh, just a couple more of these quick hitters before we call it. Uh, navigating stream crossings or just going all in and not worrying about getting wet? Zoe. Get wet. Get wet. If Kylie. you are worried about getting wet, you need to up your slot game. 
your what? Your salt game? Sock game. Sock game. Yeah. If you're like pussyfooting around creeks because you're afraid of blisters, up your sock game, get wet. <laughs> Walmart cotton socks. That's my go to. <laughs> Kylie. I go straight through. Dive yeah. in. <laughs> Drew. Yeah, I the trail runs that I've run that have like creek crossings. Um, I actually like it's fun. It's something that I don't get to experience very often. And so I really look forward to getting my hot feet in the water and almost using it as like a mental refresher, if you will. <laughs> I avoid it at all costs. I will tiptoe across the smallest rocks to avoid getting my feet wet. Um, drinking from streams. Uh, Zoe, do you bring, what do you bring a filter or do you bring, um, some kind of like other, uh, water filtration device, the little tat tablets? Um, I mean, honestly, when I would backpack, I would take tabs because not all filters kill all viruses and Giardia sucks. Um, but when I run, I typically bring a filter and then I'm not drinking from anything like that I'm like, if there's cows around, I'm not going to just rely on my filter. Um, be cognizant that, and know your filter. If it, if you need a new filter, you know, don't scamp, get a good fill. I like the, um, Solomon flask filters. Um, but yeah, again, just be cognizant that not all filters kill all viruses. Giardia is a virus that will F you up. So, but like, don't drink straight from stuff. Caveat being like if you're in the alpine you're struggling it becomes a safety concern like fresh snow and like gorgeous pristine waterfalls like maybe that's okay um but assess your risks accordingly yeah thanks super important make sure you filter your water at a minimum kylie yeah and this uh same recommendation definitely not going to go for the streams unless i was like super desperate um but i have one of the filter bottles as well um the tabs i've used before backpacking as well but the taste of those things kind of like oh it's hard for me to drink it but i will do it um but treat your water yes or use a filter bottle true i where i'm at there is no way i'm drinking any water that comes out of a stream there's so much agriculture and whatnot around here the runoff is absolutely terrible um if it was between drinking creek water and dying y'all can come to my funeral <laughs> <laughs> all right last question and then we're we're out of here does running in the heat ever get easier zoe yes kylie yes <laughs> <laughs> drew running gets less difficult running in the heat <laughs> gets less difficult we'll say it like that i think it does get easier Okay, I gotta do one more question. Does running uphill ever get easier? Zoe. Um, no. You just run faster. <laughs> so it Effort hurts more. stays the same. <laughs> Kylie. <laughs> no, it doesn't get easier. <laughs> Drew. Hell no. God, I hate hills so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The consensus is in. Running in the heat can get easier, but running uphill doesn't. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Uh, thanks, guys. Great call. Uh, we will be in uh, California next week for Western States. So we're having a group meetup, team meetup. We will not be having this call. Um, I hope to see many of you at the meetup. I know there's already like 10, 12 people signed up. So we're really excited for that. And uh, we'll catch up with you guys in two weeks. Take care.